Good day, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's forum on folio reporting and practice. Uh, my name is Peter Murray, and I'm the open source community advocate at Index Data and the host for today's forum. This session is being recorded and will be posted to the folio playlist on the Open Library Foundation YouTube channel. As an open forum, participants can see each other and all questions submitted. And we've muted everyone except for the speakers to ensure good sound quality. Uh, we do, of course, value your participation and encourage you to engage in the topic. You can use the question box within Zoom to enter questions and comments uh, as they come to you. Uh, if you like to tweet, uh, please use the hashtag Folio Forum, and I can relay those comments and questions to the panelists as well. Like all folio meetings and events, this forum is guided by the folio community code of conduct, uh, a link to which can be found on the wiki.folio.org homepage. For the forum today, we have Jen, Angela, Sharon, and Van, Vandana, Vandana. I hope I got that. <laughs> okay. Yep. Uh, Jen Colt is the head of automation and metadata systems at Cornell University. Uh, Angela Zoss is interim head of assessment and user experience strategy at Duke University. Sharon Beltane is the system library systems analyst at uh, Cornell University. And Vandana Shaw is the research and assessment analyst at Cornell University. Today, we will start with Jen, and I will end my screen sharing here and let you take it away. Okay, I will start mine and hope it works. We see, yep. Okay. Yes, we'll we see, see your presentation? slide. Yes. Okay, good. Sorry. So this is my first Folio Forum, and I just want to say I'm feeling extremely nervous for some reason, even though I talk to Folio folks all the time. So, um, but yeah, I'm Jen Colt. I'm the head of the automation unit in Cornell's technical services. Um, and so my group does a lot of automation and um, a lot, a lot of cleanup. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Whoops. Uh, whoops. Oh, I'm good. Okay. Sorry. Like I said, nerves. Um, so we use LDP to do maintenance on our inventory data in a few different ways. Um, we clean and correct ongoing issues that we know are kind of just going to keep coming up. These tend to be caused either by the way Folio works or by a human error that we just know happens all the time. Um, we use it when specific questions or problems arise, both to kind of get the general shape of the problem and then to divine fixes for it, design fixes for it, divining them would be good too. Um, and we often use it to troubleshoot problems that result from data import problems, whether they're bugs or performance. Uh, and we use it when Folio makes a change that we want to take advantage of and our data has to be cleaned or updated to do so. So Folio is flexible, and that means there can be a lot of different ways to deal with issues. Um, but for us, LDP is really the centerpiece of our maintenance and cleanup efforts for a few reasons. Uh, we know that because LDP is separate from our Folio production server, nothing we do there will affect the performance of production, and that's really important to us. The data in LDP has been built specifically for reporting purposes, and so it's user-friendly, and that makes it a lot easier for staff to use it rather than creating queries over the API, which is sort of the alternative. Uh, because we're hosted, we don't have direct access to the Folio database or anything like that. Um, and it makes it much, much easier to query data across modules, across Folio applications, 
without requiring somebody to be like an expert in the APIs. We also participate in the Folio reporting SIG, and that really helps <laughs> as well. Uh, Natalia Pakulik is on the reporting SIG, and she's also on my team. And so that means we are always on top of schema changes in a way that I think wouldn't be sustainable or wouldn't be easy to maintain um, if we weren't participating or getting help from the SIG. And it's also the only way to do a lot of the reporting that you would do, want to do on Mark data if you are a user of Mark. Um, Mark data can't be queried from the Folio UI. There is a Mark query API, but it's very limited. It wasn't designed for reporting. Um, and so if you want to report on Mark, LDP or LDP Lite um, is currently just essential. And at least for my team at Cornell, we feel like we couldn't do our work without it. So lastly, I just want to say that this presentation focuses on inventory data, um, but we have used LDP to clean up data in every area of Folio. So cleaning on and correcting ongoing data issues, these are just to step through some examples. So we do daily automated reporting and cleanup of systemic issues. Um, like multiple OCLC numbers and OCLC numbers with prefixes. So this situation is caused by Folio itself. When you use single record import in inventory, it creates a version of the OCLC number that has like the OCM or OCN prefix. And it also has a copy of the OCLC number that's formatted properly. Um, and having these not quite correct can interfere with setting your holdings in OCLC. Um, someone interrupt me if, if chat is something I should stop for. Um, and so by running this report from LDP every day, um, we're able to fix this problem that's constantly being created and have our holdings ready to be set later in the week. We also have some monthly or weekly cleanup jobs, and these tend to be more in the in the human error category, so they take longer to build up. And these are things like call numbers that have carriage returns um, or you know other bad character type things that can be introduced by cutting and pasting, um, instances and holdings that don't have quite the right relationship. So this can be um, someone suppressed a holding but left the instance unsuppressed. It can be an instance that you know should only have one holding. Like for us, our electronic resources should only have one holding in most cases. And so you can do a report that finds the ones that have too many or too few or whatever. Um, uh, we're working on some incorrect call number types that get set. Um, and all these queries are designed by Natalia. So we're super, super grateful for that. Um, and so those kind of just run on whatever schedule we decide uh, is necessary for how fast the problem builds up. And for these queries, we can either put them right in a script, like the, the daily automated for OCLC, the LDP query is just built into a Python script. And so the script queries LDP, finds the problems, edits the record, exports the records, edits them, reloads them, um, like all in one step. And then for the things that we haven't fully automated, um, we use dBeaver and we run our query, we get a CSV, and then we have a set of scripts that we use to correct these individual problems. So we just use the CSV to feed into that script. And I would say that we're still, um, so we've been live on Folio for a year and a half and we're still kind of re-implementing everything we used to have. So we will have many more things in this category, um, in both of these categories. Uh, so this is just kind of where we are right now. And I expect we will use LDP for all of them. <laughs> um, so researching, reporting, and acting on specific problems. Um, so this is like someone sees something in the catalog and they go, oh no, how many times did we do that? Um, and 
they send me that question or somebody else on my team. And for a question like that, I can use LDP and like turn around a rough answer in like five minutes. Like how many of these records are suppressed that shouldn't be, or how many records have this particular field in this particular way? Like I can turn those around really quickly, which is nice because one of the first things you want to know is like, how bad is the problem? Somebody asked me a question the other day. I looked it up, 450 records. Okay, not that big a problem. And then after we do that, we can use LDP to kind of sort their problem into two piles. Um, we use it to kind of create a pile of problems that we think we can probably fix with a script um, and then create a separate, hopefully small, reasonable report that we can give them to review as a human. Um, because a lot of times, I mean, cataloging problems just require humans. Like they require an expert to look at them, but they can't do that if there's 10,000 records. Uh, if we can say, you know, we fixed almost all of them. Here's a small report for you and your team. That works a lot better. These kinds of problems and reports usually involve Mark. So they have to be done in LDP. Um, a lot of times, you're looking for something that we've been doing for a while or a place where practice changed. Um, and so those problems are more than a year, year and a half old, which means the problems were made in Mark, at least if they're at the bib record level. Um, and so it's, so we really have to use LDP for these. So just some recent things that we've done. Um, we've been helping to flip some subject headings We've been reviewing some records that we were kind of trying to figure out. Uh, the records are in how do you trust, but we withdrew them and they're suppressed. Should, what should we do? How should these display? We've been working on uh, adding donor information to our bib records because that lets us display it in our catalog. And um, we also use it to like correct problems that we humans make in data import. Um, so somebody might import a set of records give them the wrong statistical code. Uh, and so LDP lets us go in the next day because ours is on a 24 hour delay, find the records they loaded, fix them, reload them. Um, so it's really useful for that. Again, touching on data import. Um, and I'm, so, so this is really Mark centered uh, just because we are still Mark centered. So I apologize if people are not. Um, so data import has some set of technical problems occurring at any given point in time. Uh, usually these are performance issues, but there can be other bugs relating to things like matching. And so LDP is really useful in mitigating those problems. Um, Christy Thomas at Chicago gave me a query that they use to query LDP before they ever load their records in data import to see how that load is going to go. And so this is usually about you know matching on identifiers and seeing what's in the database now, what would be trying to get into the database. And it kind of lets you see what's going to happen before you do something you regret, perhaps. Um, and then for us, we have really used LDP a lot to correct issues that arise when we do large data imports. So sometimes there can be like a timeout in the middle of the import, and then you end up with a these records in these weird different states. So usually what we monitor for are MARC records, also called SRS records here because MARC records are stored in source record storage. Um, so you can end up with MARC records that are not related to an instance, but are just sitting in your storage. And those can cause problems later on for matching. So we use LDP to identify those and get rid of them. Um, there can also be instances that have been attached to multiple MARC records. And when that happens, sometimes quick mark then won't open the record because it can't tell what record to open. And so you'll get an error when you try to do your editing. And so we use LDP to find those problems and fix them as well. Um, and then this is sort of a happier slide. Sometimes new features get added to Folio that are really great that we want to use. Um, but for, before we can do that, we use LDP to identify and report on the kind of the quality of the existing data. Because um, if you're going to 
move data around, that may or may not be a good time to also do some correction. You might not need to actually move all of it. Um, you might want to identify a subset. So LDP is um, really important in designing these kinds of sort of mini migrations to use new parts of Folio. So uh, right now we are working on sort of a big picture of getting our administrative data out of Mark and into the instance. We didn't have the instance in Voyager, now we do. And some of that data we think just, just shouldn't be sitting on the bib record, it should be in that instance administrative record. Uh, and we're also moving data that we had put in a folio field that existed at the time, uh, but that wasn't quite right. So now we were putting some data on our holdings that really should be in an administrative note. And so we're working on a project to move that data over. So those are my slides um, and I look forward to talking about this more later. Thanks. Great. Uh, we did have a couple questions that came in. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to say uh, if uh, uh, I uh, read a question that is going to be covered by one of the other uh, uh, panelists, uh, please just jump in and say it's coming later. Uh, um, but the, the, the first is, uh, are these uh, Cornell scripts that you're discussing shared anywhere or, or not at this point? So I have some that I've shared. I have a Git repository where I'm putting Folio snippets. Um, we did make, so there's, so I am in the learning APIs channel in the Folio Slack. And so sometimes I pop up there. Sometimes there's people who have much better answers than I do. So I don't say anything. Um, and then we also have a metadata scripting channel for folks that wanted to specifically talk about metadata stuff, kind of just, um, a smaller audience because learning APIs is kind of big at this point. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yes. And if I talked about something that you want, just tell me and I'll point you at it or post it if I haven't yet. Great. Um, also, uh, your workflows seem to be very uh, ETL intensive, uh, extract, transform and load. Uh, do you run into file size problems um, with data import? Yes, um, we mitigate that by heading our imports into um, sets of 5,000. And then we can generally bring in four sets of 5,000 at a time. So we're just kind of working around that at the moment. Okay, great. I I think that is it. Um, next up, I've forgotten the order. I'll go next. Great. I'll break up our um, our Cornell presenters. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to share my screen and I go into slideshow mode. And can I get a thumbs up if everybody's seeing my slides? We can see your slides. Wonderful. I appreciate it. Okay, great to see everybody. Hi. So I'm Angela Zoss. I'm the Interim Head of Assessment and User Experience Strategy at Duke University Libraries. I'm also the co-convener of the Folio Reporting SIG, along with Sharon Beltane, who you're, you'll hear from soon. And, um, and I'm uh, presenting today based on some of our experiences in the um, convener role uh, in the Reporting SIG. So um, here are some of the things that the Reporting SIG has been doing to help new implementers get up and running with Folio Reporting. Um, I love Jen's uh, really boots on the ground approach to how to use um, an LDP database um, and um, LDP mark to uh, to do reporting for certain areas. Um, this kind of showcasing of how implementers are um, are using Folio data is a core part of the mission of the Folio Reporting SIG, which uh, we spent some time over the last year writing up. Um, so I'll just share that the Reporting SIG um, will examine the reporting needs of institutions, offer advice on the design of Folio data models and reporting solutions, contribute time to the development of sample queries, 
provide documentation and training on topics related to folio reporting and offer a space for subject matter experts and technical experts to engage in discussion and collaboration. Um, what is especially relevant here today, I think, is this um, clause in the middle on providing documentation and training on topics related to folio reporting. Um, that's just been a real passion of the reporting SIG over the last couple of years is um, trying to build um, some kind of on-ramp for people who are just getting started with Folio and want to know all the various ways of accessing data and the different kinds of solutions people have found effective um, and how to feed that back into the community to try to um, create and support tools that are working well for reporting amongst uh, Folio implementers. Um, one of the types of ways that we've approached providing um, documentation and training on these topics is to just throw them into our meetings. So um, so we've got uh, different projects that we've um, taken on to try to uh, help our new implementers. That includes, um, as mentioned in the in the mission there, um, our uh, work toward building a query repository, we call it Folio Analytics. And um, these are queries designed to work with um, the uh, LDP1 and MetaDB software databases that are developed by Index Data. You've heard about Cornell's use of LDP, um, the LDP database to supplement their reporting through APIs. And um, we've got a query repository that helps users of those tools um, get up and running even faster. Um, we do have um, documentation pages on reporting that we maintain to help the end user community understand the range of um, of options, especially with the library data platform uh, software applications, um, but also just generally how to interact with Folio data and as, from a reporting context. And then finally, we're in the process of um, an initiative that I think we're all really excited about, which is to um, help supplement existing documentation about Folio data models. So a lot of people come to Folio and um, they may learn how to interact with applications and the interface, but maybe they have a little bit less exposure to what kinds of data that application is creating on the back end and what, what they're gonna find if they start to query that data either through the APIs or through a transformative reporting tool like Library Data Platform or MetaDB. Um, so we're, we're building out some of that. So people who um, need to learn and become experts in different kinds of folio data have a have a really good starting point. We also spend some of our meeting time just taking just taking explorations, taking adventures through different kinds of tools that are relevant for both generalized reporting um, and also folio specific reporting. So um, so some of the topics that we've covered in our meetings, uh, reporting SIG meetings happen. Um, on alternating Mondays and Thursdays. And we've tended to use the Thursday meetings for training. So think about training Thursdays if you want to come visit uh, Reporting SIG. We've covered topics like the in an intro to version control with Git and GitHub. This is um, core to the Folio project in general. So it's a skill that everyone could be um, benefiting from, but it's also uh, really handy um, if uh, you want to be sharing scripts, if you want to be sharing um, queries, if you want to be building your own repositories at your institutions. Um, we've also covered intro to SQL, which is, of course, a skill that is useful if you're um, connecting to a relational database like Library Data Platform or MetaDB, um, which is another um, software application developed by Index Data. And then um, how to query Folio APIs with Postman and LD Lite. Um, these are tools that are used, Postman is used really widely across the Folio community, um, and it accesses Folio data through the APIs. LD Lite is another tool that's part of Index Data's um, library data platform um, suite of uh, applications. And, um, and I'm going to actually demonstrate that for you here today. Uh, other types of training sessions and demonstrations in our SIG meetings are um, collected on this uh, wiki page. So we'll make sure that this slide deck goes around to everyone, or you could just kind of browse around on the reporting SIG wiki page and find um, links to all of our recordings and trainings. So without further ado, I'm going to um, demonstrate how to um, use LD Lite software to pull Folio API data into um, Python to do some transformation and reporting. This is all posted on GitHub. Um, I'm going to see if I can copy this into chat. Here is where my script is. Um, I'm, I'm being bold. 
uh, feel free to go to that link anytime, but maybe don't open the, <laughs> the notebook at the same time that I'm demonstrating. I'm not totally sure what will happen. Um, it might be fine. Uh, what, uh, what I will show is here's the, the repository for LD light. So if you want to be using LD light, this is definitely the, um, um, the first place to go for documentation, for information, for how to install, um, for examples, for how to use LD Light. This is a really great resource. Um, you'll see down here, there's API documentation, which if you click on that, you'll see all of the different functions that are available. Um, LD Light is software and it's been built. Um, it's a Python package and it's been built so that you can submit basically requests for folio data without having to learn too much about APIs. Uh, which I find really handy. So um, when I say notebook, that might be a new term for you, but Jupyter notebooks are a way of um, building um, Python scripts that um, are kind of interspersed with documentation. So it's a blend of documentation and code um, that I find really handy, especially if I want to share with people the kinds of scripts that I'm creating. Um, you'll notice that I have this stored in what's called a gist on GitHub, and the gist is a way of um, uh, sharing little snippets of code. And if you have a GitHub account, you should be able to go to gist.github.com to create your own gists. Um, you'll notice that GitHub no is pretty smart about different kinds of files. So this uh, Jupyter Notebook, it ends in IPYNB, which is, it used to be called IPython Notebook. So that's why that's the extension. Um, GitHub knows how to um, interpret this kind of file, and it has an um, it has an integration with uh, a product from Google called the Google Collaboratory or Google Colab, and the Google Collaboratory will run these Python notebooks. And so you don't even have to have Python installed on your machine; you can do all of this in the browser. And um, I've shared this uh, notebook, which you can just download if you want, use on your own machine, or you can open up Google Collaboratory um, straight from GitHub and uh, run the notebook. This is what a notebook looks like. So a Jupyter notebook um, has a lot of the, the same kind of Google look and feel where you have menus at the top. Um, but uh, this is kind of an edit interface to the notebook where, like I said, you can have kind of documentation and then you can have code in the same thing. So you can see here, it's allowing me to add chunks of either code or text into my notebook. And um, it's also showing me a table of contents because with uh, my text chunks, I've included some headings so that I can um, skip around in my notebook pretty well. Um, there are a bunch of other features to notebooks and I maybe can't cover those all in great detail today. Um, so I'm gonna close this sidebar and the notebook, um, just to give you a quick sense of how I work with notebooks, um, you uh, basically are looking for these code chunks. These code chunks have a light gray background. I don't know for sure if that's coming across in the screen share, but you should see light gray backgrounds and a play button. Um, whenever there's code in the um, the notebook. I've already hit play on this code chunk um, and it's already executed this Python code because I knew it was going to take a little bit and I didn't want to take the time um, while everyone was watching. It took about 25 seconds to execute this code chunk and it, it yielded a bunch of output here. So it gave me a bunch of messages, um, but that uh, that is just a starting place for our script adventure here today. Um, that's installing LD Lite. So I've installed LD Light by running this code chunk. You don't have to have anything special. You can run that. Um, and Jupyter Notebooks will install the, the software for you already. Once it's installed, um, I have to import it and say that that is something I want to use with my code, um, with my Python code and the rest of the notebook. So I'll run play on this code chunk. And it's going to import the LD Light package and another package called Pandas, which is a data science kind of um, data transformation package that's also really useful. The next code chunk is going to actually set up the LD Lite software so that I can use it. Um, what the LD Lite software does is it creates a little database that um, once it pulls data out of the Folio APIs, it can put data into that database um, so that I can query it a little bit more easily. Essentially, it is creating um, a light version of the same kinds of databases we're talking about um, that Cornell is using, like the LDP or the, um, the next generation of that, which is called MetaDB. These scripts improve upon the Folio APIs 
by doing extra transformation. So they're taking data out of folio and they're giving us additional kinds of transformation. Um, and that's why the LDP database is so powerful. That's why MetaDB database um, will really allow us to do a lot of complex reporting. But LD Lite is doing the same thing for people who don't have um, a hosted LDP or MetaDB instance. So if I run this, um, It'll quickly just set up, you know, this LD, which is what I'm going to use to interact with the database. And here's the database that's running in the background that I normally won't have to worry about. Um, there's a section here in this notebook that talks about the query syntax for how you query um, folio data using LD Lite and then the output you should expect. So here's the first example query. You can see I'm using the function called query. I'm specifying that I want a table called users to be the end result. I'm using the path users, which means I'm, I'm calling the users API. And then I'm sending it a query. And this query syntax basically tells me, give me all of the records that are in Folio right now in the users path. Um, you would not want to run this on a live uh, Folio instance that has more than just a test data set. That could be thousands and thousands of records, and you may want to be a little cautious about that. Um, but in this case, we know that this is connecting. Actually, I should have mentioned up here, I connected to Folio Snapshot. So this is a test data set that's very small. So I run this, and the output I get is it's telling me it's querying users, and then it tells me the tables that it created. So here's how you can see all the transformations that LD Lite is doing. So I'm not just getting the JSON data that I would normally get from the API. I'm getting um, a bunch of extra types of tables that um, are going to be easier to use than JSON, especially if you need to unpack some of that JSON, which is very hierarchical. Um, once you want to access the query results, you're also going to call the LD. You're going to call the, the, the LD Lite um, function called select. And you can say basically like you're working with a, a database, but you don't have to write the SQL for it. You basically say, I want to select data from this, this table that got created called users T, which is a transformation of the original API data. I want to get these columns back. And I want to limit it to just 10 records. And so that's what this function is going to do. Um, and you may not know exactly just by looking how to use all the LD Lite functions, but this LD Lite API documentation is going to give you lots of information on what functions are available and um, how to use them. So basically, I just ran a query against a Folio API live, and I got the data back in a table format, and I was able to limit it to just the um, the columns that I'm interested in in just a few rows. Um, and you can definitely um, get more advanced by using different kinds of C uh, CQL queries. So for example, in this query, I've changed the query so that instead of getting all records, I'm only getting records where the last name is Denizik or the username is DIKU admin. And so LD Lite ran another query and it created a new set of tables based on this new name that I passed. And then if I select the data from that table, I see different data. I'm going to let the rest of the notebook kind of speak for itself. I've got some examples in here of how else you can how you can get this data out again from Python. So you can either export the data straight from the LD Lite database, or you can even push it into that pandas package that I mentioned. Um, one nice thing about the pandas package is that um, I think I can run this code. Um, look at the the nice tables you get back. If, you, uh, if you're using pandas, you get kind of sortable tables and selectable tables in a way that's that's kind of fun. So you might you might be interested in um, in using pandas uh, if you're going to stay inside the notebook and do a little bit of, of exploration of your data in there. Um, that's all I'm going to cover today. So thanks for your attention. And um, if this kind of topic is excited, exciting for you or you want to learn more about how to interact with your folio data, I hope you'll join us in the reporting SIG. Great. Uh, I'm just going to pause here for a moment. I didn't see any questions come in. Um, I am wowed. So that might be the reaction. Uh, of others too much uh, so, too much too fast probably <laughs> uh, we'll just we'll just pause pause here oh well the genius of of jupiter notebooks is is uh, hard to fathom um 
And Got the it. nice thing about the Google Colab environment is especially if the data is not super sensitive, it makes it really easy to share. Like I can create this notebook and, can, and I can share it both on GitHub or just directly in the, the Google environment. If your campus is a Google campus, that's probably even better. Um, but those no, those notebook files are also just plain text files. You can download it. Um, you can create it locally on your machine. You can share it privately. It does not have to be in Google Colab. I just find it handy not to have to worry about installing Jupyter or uh, installing uh, Python on my local machine. Yeah. And and also you, you don't have to share, you can edit them too. You don't have to share right. them with the password. You can, you know, share the, 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 the notebook uh, and then share the password out of band or something. You don't have to Im embed it in there like- uh, That's like right, that's right. I it, it, The way that I built the password into the notebook is probably not something you would wanna do for your personal <laughs> login to Folio. That's a shared account that um, where the password is public already. Um, but uh, for personal, there's other ways definitely to pipe in credentials into something like a Jupyter notebook that you could explore if you need to be more secure than that, which you probably should. Uh, we have you, a question. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, can you run these light queries on a live production database, even if the query is very large? The the size of the query will definitely affect performance. So uh, we uh, we had a a visitor to reporting SIG who was talking about using LD Light in um, in performance, and um, probably I would recommend not running that from a notebook environment. I might create an actual Python script that has some. Um, some long running features like the ability to kind of um, share error messages or timeout messages or something. And, and I think some some queries will run overnight. So just like any work with the APIs, the, the more records you want to return from the APIs, it is possible that those queries could take a long time. And those are the operational databases. So running a really large query against the API of an operational database during like working hours, I think, could potentially really slow down the operational database. I am not an expert in that. That's my guess. Uh, great. I don't see any other questions, although we can ask them again at the end. And I believe uh, Sharon is next uh, on the list. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share. And hopefully I've got the right thing here. Let's see. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, yes. wonderful. Okay, um, uh, well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I am at uh, Cornell University Library, and uh, I'm going to walk you through what we did to prepare for implementing the LDP-1 and reporting support services. It's been quite the year and a half, uh, and uh, we've come a long way uh, in a short amount of time. So uh, also, feel free to reach out to us at Cornell if you're getting started and you have some questions about implementing. Our old system was Voyager, uh, so uh, those of you who um, are coming from that system may find uh, even more information from us, uh, but happy to help support. So let's see. <clears throat> so <laughs> uh, prior to Folio, Cornell used the Ex Libris Voyager system um, for all of our standard circulation acquisitions and cataloging uh, for 20 years. So folks were very used to that system. Uh, it was done, uh, we did reporting through Microsoft Access databases, pulling data directly from the transactional system. Um, our Folio application system went live on July 1st, 2021. And at the same time, our Folio reporting system using the library data platform software also went live on July 1st, 2021 with our critical reports in place. We started by delivering SQL queries, and then we added a um, year later uh, dashboards and automated reports. Um, so I'm going to walk you through uh, that process, uh, but uh, I think uh, it'll be helpful if you're uh, preparing to implement to know a little bit about um, how we went through this. 
So just the basics for our reporting system, we use dBeaver, um, uh, an application that you can get for free, a uh, community edition. There's also a pay edition that our reporting specialists use um, because it has a few more features that are helpful. We um, use the LDP1 rep uh, reporting database. Uh, and out of that, uh, we get CSV files, which we can use in Excel. There is a nightly data refresh from our Folio application server uh, that gives us the data that we need. So we used this for about a year um, as we became more um, comfortable with that environment. Uh, we moved to using additional applications against the LDP reporting database. Uh, we moved um, to using automated reports and uh, Tableau uh, to deliver data dashboards. Um, along the way, um, we learned uh, an, another thing that we, a major lesson that we learned was that it would be useful to have a test reporting database. What would happen is, we would implement a change to the production system. And if there were problems with that change, uh, we had to quickly recover in the production environment. So we uh, learned that having a second environment was really advantageous. So if you are able to do that, I recommend it. So what that means is that if there are software updates, uh, those are applied first to our test reporting database. And we spend a lot of time testing those changes to make sure that um, our queries will run, our dashboards will run, our automated reports will run, um, and other processes. Um, we make sure that we are comfortable uh, and have an approval process with our hosting service provider uh, so that we can apply those changes finally to the production reporting database. This structure has really helped us to minimize any uh, impacts to reporting changes um, on our users. Uh, so if you're able to do that, uh, that's very helpful. So we have more than 100 users at uh, the Cornell Library <clears throat> and um, initially, uh, our report developers needed to learn how to use SQL. Um, so that was a big uh, change for us. And um, uh, you know, we had um, uh, quite a bit of time with training and learning from each other. Um, the reaction to reporting with Folio was mixed. Uh, initially, depending on people's comfort with using SQL to get data. What we did, we uh, created uh, canned reports for everyone uh, to run, and we asked our users to change the parameters, say, you know, library, item type, that sort of thing. That was hard uh, for folks to, uh, a lot of folks, not everyone, um, to look at code, manipulate it, that sort of thing. So, um, that worked uh, initially, but our users really wanted something a little bit easier to use. Um, our more advanced users were fine with it, and they liked being able to get in and run SQL queries themselves. Um, and so it uh, really depends on your user experience level, uh, who's going to be comfortable with what kind of tool. Uh, many of our users really prefer a user-friendly intuitive interface to library data, uh, like Tableau dashboards. And then we have automated reports. So just all they have to do is go to a box drive folder and pick up their Excel files. So. Uh, these are services that we were able to continually improve upon um, as we rolled out uh, the new Folio reporting services uh, to the Cornell community, to Cornell Library uh, community. Um, another thing that we did uh, was we set up a GitHub report repository um, to store all of our queries against uh, Folio. And um, each query has been named with the standard conventions and has documentation to describe what the query does. Keeping your code in a central location that is easy for people to access helps users find and run queries easily. And it provides examples for report developers to see when they're starting a new query. Um, also very helpful to keep all of your code in one place when you're making universal changes for newer changed data fields. 
updating queries or preparing for transitions to new platforms like moving all your code from the LDP1 format to MetaDB format, which we were are working toward uh, in this year. Uh, so uh, to start our process for moving people into a whole new reporting paradigm, um, we identified, documented, and prioritized 100 uh, report requirements from different functional areas of the library, like circulation, finance, cataloging. The queries for critical reports were drafted prior to go live and tested in Folio project test instances. Uh, so those were very helpful for us. Uh, so we were able to do quick drafts uh, for our critical reports. Once we were uh, live with the LDP production system, those draft queries could be refined and expanded to include more data points. Also, um, many queries required Cornell only data to be understood fully and developed uh, according to our users' needs. So uh, building our reporting team was critical to our success. Uh, it really helped us to have a reporting team with representatives from key data areas of the library to help clarify report requirements and business needs for implementation. Those folks also gained a new skill set, um, learning how to use SQL in order to pull data from our reporting database uh, and um, also learning how to use Tableau for our data dashboard. So um, it's really good to have folks from all over the library if you can work on your team initially. We have folks from accounting, acquisitions, assessment, cataloging, circulation, uh, automation, uh, and uh, library technical uh, services and different IT systems areas. Uh, it uh, helped us also to set up a support structure for uh, reporting at uh, the Cornell Library. Um, we created a website with instructions for using reporting services and technical documentation uh, so people could set things up, see samples, uh, get their questions answered. Um, we are continuously developing that documentation um, as new data delivery services are um, uh, created, added. Training is also an important uh, part of doing your implementation. All reporting users uh, were trained on using the reporting tools. Specialized training is offered for different functional areas. And we have continuous training um, in a reporting users group uh, that we have. So those who really want to dig in and uh, learn how to manipulate data in our reporting database uh, have that avenue. Uh, we also have um, a help ticket tracking system. Um, so people can ask us questions at any time uh, and ask for additional reports, um, ask questions about data interpretation, etc. We, in our website, we created a one-stop shop for help. So it's real easy. People just go to the Folio Reporting website and they get uh, our, our goal is to provide them with uh, links to all the information that they need in one place. Uh, so this has been very helpful for streamlining uh, access to our services. Some of the challenges um, that we had along the way, the bleeding edge of technology, it can be hard uh, to be using a an entirely new reporting database infrastructure, uh, an entirely new uh, application infrastructure, the two of those together, uh, dealing with constantly evolving software and being able to anticipate and accommodate those changes. Um, library staff have been, you know, had been working in the same system for 20 years. So they had well honed skills in our old system. So there was a lot of work to do to uh, train folks in using the new system. And of course, uh, it was hard. Uh, so everybody um, had to work hard to learn how to get new skills in our new system. Uh, so uh, 
building a new skill set uh, for reporting is kind of a double-edged sword. Um, it's hard to learn SQL initially uh, for folks to get in there and, and build their own reports. Um, and that was a, a steep learning curve um, for folks. But it's really a great skill to have, um, uh, especially in libraries where you're working with a lot of data. So uh, on the other end of things, I think folks who've had to dig in and really uh, learn how to do the reporting have appreciated the opportunity to learn this, uh, gain this new skill set. So having a small team to develop the skill set to deliver the reports and support them has been very advantageous for us. Uh, saving your legacy system data, if you can, is wonderful. We have uh, created a whole database in Postgres of our uh, data from our old system, our Voyager system, and we brought those tables into our LDP. And now we can report on data that's prior to our implementation date. Um, so it's very advantageous. If you can do that, uh, it is uh, really helpful. Uh, it means our trend reporting can go uh, back into the past a little bit more. Another challenge has been um, working with day old data. So with our transactional system, people had access to um, any data that was immediately updated. Um, so it, it's been a slight challenge. Most of our reports don't require you know, immediate data. So, uh, but it's just been the reports that where people needed to have instantaneous data has been a little bit more challenging. Uh, this will change with MetaDB uh, because it's using that streaming and providing uh, live updates to data. So um, this is uh, something that will, will change. Uh, hosting service providers are also new to having Folio and LDP to support, and so uh, really uh, the most uh, the way that we have worked with this is to team with our hosting service provider to give them a lot of feedback on what's working, what's not, uh, and um, that has been. Uh, it's been challenging for them, just as it's been challenging for us to go to a new system. Um, also, again, we are uh, adapting to Folio software changes and that has a ripple effect into the reporting software. So we've had to uh, adapt to that. Um, queries, dashboards require constant maintenance as the Folio software has changed. Uh, for instance, new fields for uh, different uh, notes, uh, new data types, um, all have to be accommodated by rewriting, um, revising our, our scripts. Many benefits uh, to moving to the new reporting system. Um, it's designed by Folio project participants. So here you have this wonderful international community of folks uh, putting their brains to what's going to be uh, really useful in a new reporting system. Um, we're helping to libraries move to data warehousing for data analytics, and um, that's a really uh, good in infrastructure set up uh, for any kind of environment where you have large amounts of data uh, to work with. So it takes the pressure off that transactional system. There are uh, many different reporting applications that can be used against um, the LDP and MetaDB environment. So having that flexibility has been very helpful for us. Uh, the LDP supports several data intensive areas of the library, uh, reporting itself, automation, uh, data export, hoty trust, interlibrary loan, working with vendors, all that is supportive. The LDP allows the use of data sets beyond the main library system. Uh, having our legacy data uh, has been very helpful for us. Uh, it is um, challenging to convert that data, um, but uh, if you are able to do it, it is uh, very helpful to have that available. Um, the reporting community extends beyond the walls of our own libraries, and so we get lots of growth and new ideas, new learning, great opportunities uh, to work with folks from all over the world to develop our skills and uh, technologies together. So uh, it's been a wonderful opportunity for us uh, in that regard. Yeah. And so if are there any questions?
There is one, um, sorry, I'm moving a window out of the way. Uh, can you bring Mark data from your legacy system into MetaDB? Uh, we are not we are considering not migrating our withdrawn records, but hope to instead have them available in MetaDB. I don't know if you could bring them from the mark from the legacy system. Uh, we did not um, bring those into our LDP. So, um, uh, and I'm I'm not sure. Uh, Jen may have talked about that in meetings, um, being more involved in automation. Um, Angela, you, you wrote a, a comment. Um, I did. I uh, said at least folio data. There is a, you know, there's custom tables. So in um, LDP1 and MetaDB databases, you can create whatever tables you want. They're just an open Postgres database. And so you can create your own schema and you can populate it with legacy data. Um, mm. Applying the MetaDB or LDP mark transformations to legacy data, I'm not sure that that would be possible, but I actually don't. Yeah. So, so the kind of transformations that the folio SRS records get into kind of a mark tab format um, might not be something that could be reproduced at this point on on old data um, on legacy data but the data themselves and any transformations you want to do to your mark data can be stored alongside folio data in um, in an ldp or a, a metadb database yeah thank so you jen yeah figuring out mark in in a in a uh, uh tabular data format that becomes your responsibility. Yeah, that's a um, that's a, a a growth area potentially, but yeah, I don't think that's currently <laughs> supported um, by LDP Mark. Yeah. Ah, fun times. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Uh, fourth here on the list is uh, Vandena. Um, I'm getting better at that, I hope. Uh, take it away. Hey, hi, can you all see my screen? Can see your screen and can hear you, yes. Okay, great. So I'm Vandana Shah, Research and Assessment Analyst at Cornell University Library. And this is just a quick overview of Cornell's experience with Tableau dashboards using LDP data. I'll show you the whys and the hows of Tableau for Cornell, and that mainly just demo some of the dashboards that are currently in use. If I can get this to move, that would be good. Okay, so why why did we decide to go the Tableau route? Um, Tableau is a popular visual analytics platform and it is well supported for the most part. Uh, Tableau dashboards are also a means of making data instantly and easily available for staff. As Sharon mentioned, not all our staff are particularly thrilled with having to learn SQL and new ways to access data. So Tableau dashboards give them what they need. You know, the learning curve pretty much for getting your data from Tableau is zero over here. Um, the learning curve for people who create dashboards is not zero, but if you want to get your data out of created dashboards, that is really easy. Also, the dashboards are interactive. Um, I just put up a couple of screenshots here of Cornell dashboards. Uh, they have different kinds of filters to them that you can put on there. And so people can parse out their data and they can also download these data into um, Excel or PDF formats. Tableau supports many different types of data sources. It's pretty easy to connect to different sources. So you can connect to um, local files and you can also connect to um, a data warehouses or um, to servers. And also you can have multiple data connections in one dashboard in one view. So you can have a local file data from the local file and also from your server or from wherever else you want your data. So here is using Tableau with LDP1. So it's pretty straightforward to connect to the LDP using Tableau's Postgres connector. You just need to have um, LDP1 host permissions and authentication, that's about it. So once you connect Tableau to the LDP uh, data, there are two ways of bringing in data. The one, 
way is you just bring in all the data tables that you have, and then you create table joins and different things within the Tableau environment. The other way is to embed SQL queries into Tableau and only pull up the required data fields. Now, given the complexity of Tableau or of folio data, just given how many tables there are and the huge amounts of, of data in there, for the most part at Cornell, for our dashboards, we've gone the route of embedding SQL queries and only pulling out what we need for a specific view. And the other thing that's really useful is that multiple queries can be embedded into one dashboard. When I'll show you a dashboard, I'll explain more clearly what I mean. Um, a little bit more about using Tableau with LDP is um, over here, I'd like to acknowledge the role of the reporting SIG and of uh, Folio Analytics. I think Angela and Sharon have both mentioned that, uh, the Folio Analytics, the GitHub repository. So these, the in this repository, we have original queries that were co-written and tested by members of the reporting SIG. So early on, as Sharon mentioned, before we went the dashboard route, we had adapted several of these general queries for Cornell. And then we started writing a lot of our own queries and 100 is the magic number. I think currently we have almost 100 Cornell specific queries and we're adding to these every week. So we use these customized queries, the Cornell customized queries to create dashboards for Tableau desktop. And these are then uploaded to the Cornell Tableau server. And here I'd like to mention that your institution doesn't really need to have a Tableau server. There's different ways of making dashboards available to, to viewers. So we initially set up the Tableau dashboards with live connections to the LDP. So that meant that anytime somebody was looking at a dashboard, they would be hitting the LDP. So in cases of complex queries where, you know, you have a large amount of data involved, oops, where did I jump to that? Sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. And I... Here we are, uh, where we have you know, a large amount of data involved, we decided it was easier to go the extract route. And this is now the Tableau functionality where you can create data extracts and these are refreshed once a day. So when people access a dashboard, they're not hitting the LDP directly. One big thing that we can do over here, and this is something that was important for Cornell, is that each dashboard can be given its own set of user permissions. So for example, we have finance dashboards and only the finance and budget office can view these dashboards. We have selector dashboards that are only accessible to selectors and related staff. And then we have all staff dashboards that all staff can view. And before I do some demos, I just wanted to quickly mention cons or challenges here. Tableau licensing to create dashboards is expensive. It's not expensive to view. That's pretty much a few free service, but to actually create them through Tableau desktop, that can be expensive. And as Shan mentioned, it can be really time consuming because here we create the SQL queries and we maintain them when there are changes in the underlying data, but we also have to maintain the dashboards and the queries are always a little bit tweaked, slightly tweaked for dashboards. So we've got all these different things happening at the same time. And I'm just gonna do a couple of quick demos here of our dashboards. Okay. So as I mentioned, we have different types of dashboards and I'm not going to demo the selector dashboards, but I wanted to show you all the different types we have. These selector dashboards are used by selectors pretty much all the time. Like we have their fund details or their expenditures, approved invoices, and this is how selectors keep a track of a lot of their monies and their items. Um, we have all staff dashboards over here, and these I can show you quickly. So um, these are used for different purposes. They are used by circulation staff right now, and we're in the process of creating more dashboards. The very first one, physical item circulation counts, this is used by, um, this is also used for annual data reporting. So here we are, as you can see this dashboard. So this one is a count of loans and renewals over here. So here we've hard coded a fiscal year. 
So people can choose any one fiscal year they want, but they cannot have data from both because that would be a little misleading here. We have different filters here. Oh, okay. That needed to refresh itself. We have a different filters here for, let's say, patron group name. And let's say we want to leave out borrow direct. So these are drop down filters. You can just click away and it's going to remove the borrow direct um, loans and counts from here. We can have collection types. We can have material type names. And maybe we don't want to have any computer files. And we can click out of those. And a library name is also very useful to have. Um, Tableau has all these nice little gizmos, so we can have this little hover over here for data and notes because you don't want to include a lot of text into the main dashboard. So you can just display any important text this way. And we also discovered that when we have a lot of filters going on here, it's just easier for people to refresh them all at once. So clicking on this, we can just get all our filters refreshed and people come back to right where they started over here. So when I was mentioning, you can have multiple queries on one dashboard. Underlying this one is a loans and renewals query. And then connected with that, this is you know, kind of connected information that people want to see is, for example, account of filled requests of patrons. These are filled patron requests. This is a separate query. And both these are put into the same dashboard over here. So over here, this is by pickup service point, um, you know, they were, whether it was contactless pickup during the pandemic or so desk pickup. And um, for the details, all of these can be downloaded. Now I'm trying to get to the, the next dashboard if I can over here. Okay, this is the circulation transactions um, dashboard over here. Uh, this starts off with just giving an overview of circulation transactions. And here we're talking only of check-ins and check-outs, for example. Um, some of this information is used to, to sort of determine staffing. So in all these related um, views over here, over here, for example, we have transactions. Oh dear, sorry about that. I was kind of worried something like this might happen at one point. Where has this brought me? <laughs> okay, people, I'm going to try and get us back to where we were. Okay. This is like one of those Murphy's laws, right? When you want to display this dashboard, it's going to just die on you over here. Okay, it seems to have come back now. Thank you. Um, let me get to the current fiscal year. And hopefully that won't kill it again. Okay, so this is the overview. And for, let's say for staffing purposes, let's say we want to see transactions by time of day over here. So this gives us an idea by time of day for all of our different um, service points over here. And let's say we're not interested really in check-ins because people can just drop their books into a drop box. We're only interested in checkouts. So we can see what's happening with checkouts. And then we find a service point over here for us. And we don't want all our libraries. We're just going to be looking at man library over here. And so here we can see that in the afternoon times, that's when we really have to be a little bit more aware of having adequate staff at Man Library because that's where most of the checkouts take place um, and not so many um, during the morning times. So that's the circulation um, uh, desk transactions one. And the last one that I had over here was the missing and in transit items one. Just going to display back up here. And this is the one which sort of helps. This one is used for multiple purposes, missing and in-transit items. Um, it sort of helps people at circulation. This is just a summary by, by library name of all our missing items. There's no real date here because this is missing items as of current date. Um, these have not been aged to last as yet. Here are some details of missing items and all this information then can be downloaded and people can select their specific um, library locations. One advantage here is that apart from these drop down filters, you can also set up search filters over here. Like for example, this is just wildcard search over here. I want to just do like birds, for example, that's the book I'm looking for. And I can 
pick select my birds over here, and I'm going to get details of that particular missing book over here. And this is about in transit items. So this one is useful because sometimes items can be in transit forever. Like why is this item in transit for 485 days? Certainly that's something that needs to be checked on and looked out for. So this is like a troubleshooting dashboard that we have over here. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think of anything else I can tell you about dashboards. Um, yep, so that is just a quick overview of some of the dashboards. And I think that is all I have for now, unless there are any questions. I don't see any questions yet, but you're getting congratulations for running a live demo and then recovering nicely. <laughs> Thank you. I sort of thought that was going to happen, but there's no other way to show dashboards apart from doing a live demo. So yes. <laughs> thank you for your yes. patience, everyone. <laughs> Uh, and it's it's I don't often get to see Tableau. That's uh, that's nice to see that the the power that that uh, it has to do uh, the things like that. It's it's definitely been very useful for our selectors. Um, you know, especially when it comes to their funds and their budgets. And I'm sorry I couldn't show you those, but uh, those I think are the ones that are most used. Just going to pause here for another moment uh, to see if there are any questions that are being typed. And let me just check Twitter as well one more time. Okay, nothing there, nothing in the questions. Okay. I think this concludes today's forum on folio reporting in practice. Uh, the recording for this forum will be posted shortly to the folio playlist on YouTube. Uh, and you can find that at youtube.com slash open library foundation, all one word. If you have any feedback on today's forum or have an idea for a future forum, uh, please contact the forum facilitators. Our contact information is on the wiki page, uh, wiki.folio.org slash display slash facilitators. Uh, I see the congratulations and the thank yous uh, rolling in. Uh, thank you to Jen, Angela, Sharon, and uh, Vandana. Uh, and thank you to everyone who participated in today's event. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm.